welcome back. I hope everyone enjoyed your lunch and you're ready to continue our discussions. We have two more sessions before we conclude for the day. And in our third session, we move on to lessons from the prophet. The speakers, Dr. Yasmin Amin, Dr. Shadab Rahim Tula, and Dr. Sarah Ababne. Where is Dr. Sarah? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Sarah Ababne uh, and moderator Baroness Shaista Gohir uh, will discuss different methodologies to explore the Prophet's lived experiences and teaching and also propose frameworks for how marriages can be grounded in equality and justice. So let me introduce you to them. Dr. Yasmin Amin is the Orient Institute Beirut Max Weber Shiftang representative in Cairo. She received her PhD in Islamic Studies in 2021 from Exeter University's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies and MA in 2010 from American University in Cairo. Her research covers gender issues in early Muslim society and culture, as well as the original texts of Islamic history, law, and hadith. Dr. Sarah Ababne, and she's coming, <laughs> <laughs> is a lecturer in international relations at the Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Sheffield, and former associate professor at the Center for Strategic Studies, University of Jordan. Her research interests include class, gender, and struggles for liberation and change. Dr. Shadab Rahim Tula is a lecturer in Islam and Christian Muslim relations at the School of Divinity, University of Edinburgh, and former assistant professor at the University of Jordan. His primary interests lie in how religion can be reinterpreted as a liberating force to confront contexts of oppression, including patriarchy, empire, poverty, and racism. Our moderator, Baroness Shai Sagori, was appointed to the House of Lords as a non-party political peer in 2022. She has worked in the charity sector for nearly 20 years, is a leading women's rights campaigner, and recognized as one of the most influential Muslim women in Britain. We are so grateful for her for taking the time today to participate in this event. I now give it to the speaker and speakers and moderator. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, now that you have um, food and water in your bellies, you're not allowed to feel sleepy. You've got to stay alert for this exciting session. And all of the sessions have been exciting, but I think this is even more exciting. And I'm going to say that because um, it's um, my panel. Uh, but, before, but, but before I introduce the speakers, I just want to really thank, uh, you know, Masawa for asking me to host this panel because I feel that I've gone on a journey with Masawa because just, I just want to quickly say that in, in 2008, I was exposed to egalitarian interpretations of Islam. Before that, I just assumed there was only one way to interpret women's rights, and I just accepted it without question. And I was exposed to an alternative, and that changed my life. I went to the Masawa launch in 2009, and Diba said, a lot has happened with Masawa, how it's grown. Actually, a lot has happened with Muslim Women's Network. At that point, it was myself, Faiza, who's going to be moderating the next panel, uh, was a volunteer. And between myself and Faiza, we grew uh, Muslim Women's Network. It's a nationally recognized charity. We've got 16 staff. And... What we learned is the foundation. So we don't talk about Islam all the time, but we make sure any publication that we have, we will provide these um, egalitarian interpretations. So earlier this morning, people spoke about what do you do in minority contexts? Well, actually, the knowledge that's being produced is really important. We have been using it as activists. To give you an example, we uh, published a Muslim marriage and divorce booklet that is our most downloaded resource. All the other resources on domestic abuse, mental health, few thousand downloads. That's been downloaded over 40,000 times in the last few years. We've also produced a booklet on women's rights in Islam, and we mention um, uh, you know, the Masawa uh, men in charge in there. So what I'd like to do is probably get this book and just turn it into a pamphlet and make sure that information gets out there. So I'm honored now that I was learning from Masawa and I'm sat here now moderating a panel. So thank you very much. So I've gone on a journey with you. So now to the panelists. So um, as um, it's been introduced, it's lessons from the prophet. So we are going to now start looking at and exploring uh, the, the marriages of the prophet. And while you're sitting there, you can start thinking to yourself, does that reflect everyday life today, yes or no, and I'm sure you will have lots and lots of questions. 
So we've got three speakers. Um, first up will be Dr. Yasmin Amin, and she will be talking about marriage in the Hadith, and you'll be talking about uh, in the Prophet's marriage and what the Hadith said about them. So over to you. Thank you very much for having me and for returning after lunch. <laughs> so I will give a short overview of my chapter and perhaps focus on some parts that I think are important. The rest you can read in the book, which I advise you to buy. Not because I get any royalties, but because it is an amazing book as you have heard repeatedly today. <clears throat> so the title of my chapter is part of a hadith where the prophet said that a wife has rights over her husband. The question part, or does she, is explained in the introduction. Because we have two very different and even opposing or conflicting images of marriage. While the Quran speaks of marriage as love, compassion, mercy, affection, companionship, such hiding of faults, synergy, comfort, and protection, and designates the mahr, the dower, as a gift. The fiqh ignores all that and turns marriage into a sale contract where the dawa and maintenance are paid for a continuous availability for legal sex. As fiqh claims that it is based on the Quran and Sunnah, qiyas, analogical reasoning, and ijma'a, consensus, I then look into the Sunnah of the Prophet and what he said about marriage in general and his own marriages in particular. But before I do that, I give a quick overview about the aversion of feminist scholars for using hadith and how problematic they find it and also what can be changed. Because hadith really is very important and I hope to convince you all of that by the end. Verse 59.7 says, whatever the apostle gives you, accept it, and from whatever he forbids you, keep away. This was always interpreted as to mean the hadith, and working from the, within the tradition means not to discard hadith. Feminists have used different methodolog methodologies to deal with hadith when they did, but most of the time they did not because the majority of them preferred to argue and make their points using the Quran. I will not get into the details here except to highlight that today we have cumulative knowledge built over centuries, starting with the classical Hadith scholars that devised methods to sift the forged from the authentic Hadith reports. Regardless of the different methodologies, the main thing is that the Hadith reports, um, this becomes, oops, might contain kernels of truth that we need to find and use are indicative of the memory of the early Muslims and their respective ideologies, not necessarily that of the Prophet. They show generational patriarchal biases that tried to sabotage the egalitarian values of the Quran and Islam, and a close reading can provide different interpretations that allow for gender justice. My own methodology is based on Baba Rashtovas's methodology she divorced herself from the authenticity issue because it really does not get us very far. I mean, once we know that this hadith is forged or it's not forged, it's authentic, then what? We don't have anything much to work with. So Shtovasa decided to take the hadith at face value without looking at its classification. She argued that since these hadith reports are found in the collections, they were accepted by at least a segment of the Muslim society who collected and preserved them. I used the same approach, but I expanded a little using Kishi Ali's advice on how to transcend the limitations of authenticity by asking new questions. For example, what are the implications of the Prophet's words and deeds for us today? 
is his precedent binding, were his statements prescriptive or descriptive? Because if they were prescriptive, they should have led to the imposition of a legal rule. And even if they were only descriptive, they should still be followed as the Quran instructs Muslims in verse 3321 to follow the Prophet's example. Finally, I will put the different hadith reports in conversation with the Quran and with each other to attempt to find that elusive kernel of truth in the hadith. So I have divided the hadith that I work with into four groups. The first group speaks about the foundations of marriage, the second one about dower and maintenance, the third about mutual care, kindness, trust, and conflict resolution, and the last one is bedroom etiquette. As you can see, this is more or less based on the conflicting contradictory images of marriage, the Quranic one and the Fiqhi one, to determine what went wrong. So the foundation of marriage, <clears throat> I will not go through all the hadith reports, but just summarize the most important takeaways. And they are that marriage requires both partners to be God conscious, as this is an integral part of every believer to live his religious ideals. Marriage is not only an outlet for legal sex, but spouses are urged to choose one another based on appeal, attraction, and affection that will ultimately lead to love, which is important and as the Prophet likened it to risk blessings, which should also be extended beyond the death of the spouse. Appeal extends to the spousal characteristics like beauty, lineage, wealth, and religious faith, which is the most important one, as it is the one that is lasting. The others are just fleeting. Marriage to widows and divorced women with children is not only encouraged, but actively promoted due to several reasons, um, meaning giving orphans a home. The Prophet himself married several divorced or widowed women with children, and <clears throat> he raised them lovingly and gave them a home. And all that contradicts the fiqhi fixation with virginity as a preferred status. Only two of the Prophet's wives were virgins, Aisha and Maria al Qutay. Dower and maintenance, as in the Quran, in the Sunnah, the dower is considered a gift, and the maintenance is the husband's duty, not an exchange or a payment for any service rendered, sexual or otherwise. In fact, the dower was considered a debt until it was paid in full to the wife, not anyone else, herself. Um, and paid it had to be, whether in monetary terms or material value or even in kind when he was short of cash. Non-payment of that debt rendered the husband not only indebted, but also deceitful, deceiving not only his wife, but God. Maintenance includes clothing, food, housing, and more, and spending on one's family is considered a sadaqa, a type of charity, which was rewarded. This also contradicts the fiqhi concept of it being a payment for a service rendered reducing marriage more or less to prostitution, payment for sex. Mutual care, kindness, trust, and conflict resolution. Marriage is complex, and the prophet advised his community on how to deal with the stormy parts of the marriage. Marriage should be celebrated. Joy should continue throughout the marriage itself, living out the playful side, having fun, also paying attention to personal and little details like changing moods of the partners, exchanging gifts, beautifying oneself for one's spouse, treating one another with rifq, gentleness, and kindness, not spilling any marital secrets to others outside the marriage, and trust and sharing responsibilities and duties like distributing household chores. The prophet used to wash his own clothes, mend his own shoes, he used to milk the goats and do the dishes, believe it or not. And now we get to the bedroom etiquette, which is a very important section, since fiqh makes this the sole and only reason for marriage and for payment of dower and maintenance. While Islam recognizes intimate relations or sexual relations as not only leading to procreation, but for the sake of pleasure, 
The wife does not have to be available 24 seven. Fiqh focuses on male pleasure only and her, the wife's responsibility is to please her husband regardless of her own needs or even fulfilling them. But in the sunnah, this is not the case. The Prophet's advice urged men to ensure that their wives were fulfilled as well and that their desires were awakened before engaging in the act. Um, women should not be rushed and if a man finished before his wife, he should make sure to also allow her to be fulfilled and pleasured. Foreplay was important and also the aftermath to extend the intimacy by bathing together, performing the ritual purity wash together from the same container and things like that. Closeness and intimacy was not only tied to intercourse, but intimacy goes a long way, even during times where intercourse was prohibited, like during menstruation or something like that. So loving gestures, hugs, caresses, kisses were recommended during such times where intercourse couldn't take place, not treating the wife as if she had the plague. So again, we see a completely opposite picture of what is presented in fiqh. So this leads us very nicely into the next section, namely that of the women demeaning hadith reports and how we can deal with those. These reports center on the assumption that a wife's ticket to paradise is through being obedient to her husband and bending over backwards to please him, even if he was unreasonable or demanded idiotic things, like if a man orders his wife to move from the red mountain to the black mountain, and then again from the black mountain back to the red mountain, it is incumbent upon her to obey. This is a hadith, I, I kid you not. Or we have all heard the hadith that no woman can fulfill her duty towards Allah until she fulfills her duty towards her husband. And also the famous one, or infamous one rather, that if I were to command anyone to prostrate in front of anyone else, I would command woman to prostrate in front of her husband. Moreover, many reports condemn women's sexuality and limit their sexual participation to pleasing their husbands whenever and wherever he wishes. So such narratives are found in abundance and in various versions, such as the one claiming that the prophet said, if a man calls his wife to bed and she refuses, the angels will curse her all night long. This particular report comes in numerous variants that all urge the wife to comply immediately. In one version, she has to obey even if she is sitting on the back of a camel. Jump down, go and service him. Um, and the other one, if she's in front of an oven baking or cooking, she has to drop everything and run. One of my favorite hadith reports is a report claiming that the prophet said, God created 10 parts of desire and then made nine parts in women and one part in men. Had God not given them shyness in proportion to their appetites, every man would have nine women clinging to him. In a different version, the prophet allegedly said, desire was made into 10 parts of which nine parts were given to women and one to men. Had it not been for the modesty that was imposed on women with regard to their desire, every man would have nine nymphomaniacs clinging to his neck. Yet none of the muhaddithun noticed the logical flaw in that narrative. Because if men were given one part and women nine, then nine men would be needed to satisfy one woman. Therefore, one can only conclude that the discussion of sex in the legal manuals is based mostly on men's sexual fantasies, where women's opinions and voices remain completely absent from the discussion. Interestingly, the Hadith scholars already recognized that these reports did not mirror the Prophet's behavior and his adherence to the Quran, because Aisha reports in a Hadith that his manner was the Quran. According to the Hadith scholars' own classification, the authenticity of these tradition, rain, traditions ranges from being da'if, weak, to being 
Hassan Gharib, good yet strange. And all of them are solitary transmissions, hadith ahad. So they should never be used for any legal ruling of any kind. Um, there is no question that these traditions have serious theological, moral, and social consequences. To conclude, we have already noted that the four sources of Islamic law are allegedly the Quran, the Prophet's Sunnah, Ijma' and Qiyas. We have seen that the Quran painted a different image of marriage and that the Sunnah reinforces that very same Quranic image, both in the words and the deeds of the Prophet. Moreover, the women demeaning a hadith go both, both against the Quranic spirit as well as against the Prophet's example, pointing to forgeries or faulty qiyas. Most importantly, the ijma', the consensus, is more of a myth perpetuated by male scholars and theologians. In fact, there is no consensus to define what consensus really is, whose consensus it is, whether it is the entire community or only its theologians. In fact, there is also no consensus on the competence of the constituent members, on the period covered, on the scope of its subject matter, on the source of its authority, on, on, on whether matters of creed and dogma fall into its scope or not, on whether it must be on the basis of a positive expression or can be based on <clears throat> the silence of others. And finally, once a so-called consensus is reached, on whether it can be modified in the future based on new evidence or we're stuck with it until the end of time. Yet when male privilege was at stake, male scholars and jurists protected their own interests and that of other men by ignoring the divine text and the prophet's example, basing their rulings on their own wishes and that mythical consensus. So what do we do? We can correct that by revisiting the basis of fiqh rulings and by re-examining the Quran and the Prophet's example. It is clear from the reports that we discussed that fiqh manuals departed greatly from the Prophet's example, and it was these rulings that guided the development of contemporary family laws. The conversations between the different reports and genres, fiqh, Quran, show the historical progression and the gradual discrepancies between the letter and the spirit of the law. Additionally, they show how the Hadith literature was hugely manipulated. Yet it is possible to use traditional along with new methodologies to better align laws and practices with the Prophet's example. The prophetic marriage model can be revived to improve the lived realities of the women, of contemporary Muslim women, through emulating Muhammad's behavior and following these advice given in these reports. The prophetic advice was prescriptive and should have been incorporated in the laws and in the rules of fiqh and the regulations. So there are two tools that allow us to do that, namely istihsan and istislah. So istihsan linguistically means to seek the good, aiming at the best. It is a legal principle whereby laws are established based on guidelines and injunctions from the Quran and the Hadith, as they allege but don't do. It is simply the expression of the idea that equity and justice as defined by God must determine both the formulation and the interpretation of laws. Istislah means to seek what is correct and wholesome in the development of the law. It holds that while the Quran and Hadith lay down the framework of the law, the rest must be elaborated by its guiding principles. Discourses on Muslim women are never monolithic. They are varied and contradictory depending on the power structures involved in the process. Khaled Abul Fadl argues the consensus of one generation does not bind another, and an immoral unanimity is immoral all the same. Therefore, we need a new qiyas using the same traditional as well as new methodologies, but to also ask new questions and use old and new analytical tools to revisit the subject, and an overhaul of fiqh is much needed to generate a new discourse, possibly and hopefully leading to a new consensus that reclaims Adl and Ihsan in Muslim marriages. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. What a cracking um, presentation. And it was really 
interesting to see the contrast in Fick, which to me sounded very transactional about power and control. I'd say coercive control, if we use today's language, um, where the woman is compliant and she's having to fulfill um, the needs um, of her husband, whereas obviously in the Quran, a very different picture um, of uh, love, compassion, affection, mutual care, and kindness. Um, and I have to say that um, when we get calls on the helpline, it's what's, what's the, the, the thick picture, basically. And sometimes women have called on the helpline, have said, we've been given that hadith about the angels will curse you all night. And then they've said, well, I went to my mom thinking, well, she's going to support me or my mother-in-law. And they've given me the exact same hadith saying, actually, your husband is correct. You have to listen to your husband. Another quick example that we've... Uh, a story that I remember was a woman who had a cesarean, and a cesarean is a major surgery with stitches, um, and she'd literally just come out of hospital and her husband demanded sex. She felt she couldn't refuse, and her stitches came open. She's bleeding and had to go back into hospital. So unfortunately, the reality um, is very different. Um, you know, you touched upon, you know, bedroom etiquette and about... Um, the prophet saying that, you know, you've got to ensure that you um, fulfill the needs of your wife before your own. Wouldn't that be really good if we could include that in the marriage contract? <laughs> so if anyone tries that and they succeed, can you let us know? Or if anyone rewrites their contract, Doreen, you know, when you rewrite your contract, you could put that one in there. Um, so but let us know, but can you imagine on the wedding day and then the imam reads that, that and, and, if it, and if you do manage to put it in, put it in the top three, not number 20. So we'll go on to the next um, session, which is uh, by, with Sara and, and Shadab. They're going to do a joint presentation. Sara will go first and really exploring uh, the Prophet's marriage with Khadija and could that provide a model marriage for today? Thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. And I'll walk you through how we're going to do this. I'm going to go first, and then Shadab will go second again, and then I'll... I'll conclude. Okay, so this is a paper that we wrote together. Um, and the main question that we look at in this paper is how we can understand the marriage between the Prophet wasallam, to Sidna Khadija radiallahu anha to question hegemonic understandings of Muslim marriage. How can we challenge what we understand as hegemonic? So how are we going to present this to you? Uh, I'm going to look first at what methodology we used. And then I'm going to present you with the theoretical framework. Then Shadab is going to look at one of the two snapshots in our chapter. We have two snapshots. One is about the marriage. And the second one is about Khadija as the first Muslima and first revelation. But we're going to focus in the presentation on the first snapshot. Then I'm going to conclude with modern objections and thinking through where these taboos come from that we think are sacred. Okay, the hegemonic narrative on ideal marriage. I think we all know it. If I were to ask you, if I were to ask you to close your eyes, I think most of you would probably think of these scenarios. The fact that the prophet had 13 wives, that all of them with the exception of Khadija were younger than him. And of course, the most notorious example would be Aisha, where we have various examples of how young she actually was. Various, not examples, but claims of how young she was. And that mostly these marriages were not done for love, but they were strategic, they were pragmatic, and they were matters of state. So these examples from the Sunnah make us believe that the ideal marriage, and this is what we find in most of our personal status laws, is between an older, mature, powerful man to a very young woman. Right? We have the, in Arabic, you say, you know, somebody who he can then raise on his Example of the Prophet's marriage to Ibn Khadija, which was a monogamous marriage. It lasted 25 years, and she was not just his employer, but also older than him. So what kind of sunnah could we think of that is based on that marriage? 
Let me walk you through the sources that we looked at for this paper. So we did not go to alternative sources. We actually looked at traditional Sira sources. Well, so we examined Muhammad bin Ishaq, Muhammad bin Sa'ad, Abu Ja'far al-Tabari, and Ismail ibn Kathir. So these are the traditional Sira sources. And what we looked at is trying to reconstruct the narrative, finding information, but also their attitudes. What we felt, what, what was normal for them and what was abnormal? Where were their silences? Where was their, did they feel the need to justify certain things or not? And then later on, we look at more modern um, jurists and looking at their attitudes, what they find outrageous. So to kind of start you off with this, I want to talk about our theoretical framework. We use, we draw on Michel Foucault, the French philosopher's understanding of the history of the present. So for Foucault, most history functions as a political tool. It is there to justify certain things in the present. So if you think of modern political thought, uh, for those of you who study international relations, for example, uh, international relations theory likes to go back to ancient Greece and Rome. And these types of theories justify a present which is colonial, where the powerful rules. So we go back in history in order to justify certain power structures to today. Or we go back to ancient Rome to say, look, woman, the father, he's, uh, you know, can he do everything with the women and slave and children of his family? This is natural. Patriarchy is natural. It's always been. And of course, what history does is it silences other examples. So what ha often happens is that the history of the present creates the present as normal, as natural, as the only way that we can be. And of course, what this is, and that's where we have to see the political nature of history, is we need to understand what is it trying to justify? What is it trying to legitimize? And uh, we would argue that when it comes to not just the history of European modernity, but also Islamic modernity, which is actually very European. It is actually the bourgeois family of the 1950s. That is actually our modern. It's not the prophet. It's not the Quran. It's not even the time of the fuqaha. But that is the model. But as we said, every kind of um, uh, form of writing is political, and so is ours. And we're not claiming not to be political ourselves. So just like certain histories create certain norms, we would like to look for different histories that could enable us to do different, to create different alternatives today. So our paper is a form of activism in which we try and bring about transformative politics. And now we would like to do that by going back to the story of the marriage between Khadija, Sayyidina Muhammad, and thinking through that. And that is where I hand over. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's always very hard to follow after Sarah. Um, as Sarah pointed out, we have two snapshots of Khadija's life. We have her marriage to the Prophet, and we have her presence during the first Quranic revelations. And because of time constraints, I'm going to focus on the first snapshot. When you look at the biographical sources, a number of features stand out that are at odds with patriarchal constructions of marriage. Firstly, Khadija was significantly older than the Prophet. The most common numbers put Khadija at 40 and Muhammad at 25, so with a 15-year age difference between them. But the exact numbers differ in the sources. Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Sa'ad both put Khadija at 40. At-Tabari puts Khadija at 28, while Ibn Kathir includes a report that puts Khadija at 35. As for Muhammad, some biographers place his age at 23 or even as low as 21. Now, the exact numbers don't matter. 
And the higher number of 40 for Khadija can't be taken literally since she would go on to mother six children with the Prophet. But the various numbers do show that Khadija was unequivocally the older partner in the marriage. They show that she was an established woman who, to cite the historian Karen Armstrong, quote, had reached the full bloom of social maturity. Khadija wasn't a virgin either. She had been in two previous marriages and brought three children with her to her union with Muhammad. Her first marriage was to Abu Hala ibn al-Nabash of the tribe of Tamim, and she had two children with him, Hind and Hala. This first marriage ended in divorce. Her second marriage was to a man named Atiq ibn Abid of the tribe of Makhzum, and she had a daughter with him also named Hind. It seems that Abid died, leaving Khadija a widow. And here I'd like to connect to a point that Sarah pointed out in terms of method. Textual silence is very important. When we think about texts, we often focus on what a text says. But today, I'd like to challenge you to also think about what a text doesn't say and what that unsaying, what that textual silence might mean for us today. If you look at the biographical literature, nowhere is there any stigma, any taboo associated with the fact that Khadija was a divorcee. On the contrary, it was Muhammad who was the young, single, inexperienced virgin. And the classical biographers don't seem to have a problem with that. They don't feel the need to comment on it or to apologize for it. In fact, Khadija's kunya, her title, remained the same throughout her life. Even when married to the Holy Prophet, Khadija's title remained Um Hind, the mother of Hind, whom she bore with her first husband. All of this stands in contrast to the heavy stigma attached to divorced women in Muslim communities today, especially divorced women with children. And it's important to add that amongst the Prophet's wives, Khadija's sexual background and sexual experience was not by any means exceptional. In one report, Aisha once boasted that she was the only virgin to be married to the Prophet. And we can add Maria Qutbiyah to that list as well. This suggests that the rest of the Prophet's wives had sexual relations with prior husbands. And in the case of Umm Salama and Umm Habiba, also had children with them. And again, this didn't seem to have been a problem, a source of stigma for the Prophet or the early Muslims. On the contrary, this was the norm. It was Aisha's and Maria's virginity that was the exception, the abnorm. Thirdly, Khadija is the one who initiated the whole arrangement. She initiated the marriage. In the narrative, she is the active subject who approaches Muhammad, who is a willing passive. I'll say a bit more about Khadija's professional life soon, but in a nutshell, she was Muhammad's employer. Impressed by his intelligence and moral personality, she proposed to him. Ibn Ishaq and At-Tabari even include the wording of her proposal. To quote Ibn Ishaq's biography, O son of my uncle, uh, Ya Ibn Ammi, it's not to be taken literally, it's a term of deference. O son of my uncle, I like you because of our relationship and your high reputation among your people, your trustworthiness, your good character, and your truthfulness, end quote. At-Tabari goes on to add, quote, all the men of her tribe would have been eager to accept this proposal had it been made to them. At-Tabari's comment is very telling because it not only shows the sheer respect that Khadija commanded within Meccan society, but it also shows that there was nothing strange or peculiar about the fact that a woman was the one proposing. Again, this is where textual silence is significant. Had it seemed odd or weird or out of place, the chroniclers would have surely commented on it. Fourthly, Khadija was the economic foundation of this 25-year-long union. As is well known, she was a successful businesswoman hiring men to trade her goods outside of Mecca, in particular Sham. 
And this was the commercial context in which she first met Muhammad. According to Ibn Sa'ad, Khadija's caravan was, quote, equal to the general caravan of the entire tribe of Quraysh. Some modern historians have suggested that Khadija gave up her business pursuits after marrying Muhammad. The scholar Sayyid A.A. Razwi claims that Khadija gave up her career and basically became a good Muslim housewife, devoting herself fully to her husband. But there is no textual evidence to support that claim, whether in terms of the Prophet's life or in Khadija's earlier marriages. Recall that she had been in two previous marriages with Abu Hala and Atiq. And in these marriages, she didn't interrupt or downsize her business career in any sort of way. So why would it be any different with her third and youngest husband, Muhammad? And this brings me to the next point, space, the spatial location of the marriage. The norm in mainstream hegemonic marriage, whether Muslim or for that matter, non-Muslim, the norm is a patrilocal relationship in which the wife physically moves into the husband's home. This spatial location is a given in Islamic family law. Ta'a, or the wife's obedience to her husband, is premised on the assumption that she is physically living in a house provided and owned by the husband who is considered the breadwinner of the family and by extension, a center point of authority. But Muhammad and Khadija had an acutely matrilocal marriage. Upon marrying, Muhammad moved into a house provided and owned by Khadija who continued to act as the main breadwinner of the new household. And this brings me to our last point, masculinity. Uncovering the various features of Khadija and Muhammad's marriage gives us critical insight into the type of man Muhammad was. What does this relationship tell us about Muhammadi masculinity, about the Prophet's sense of manhood? By all accounts, Muhammad seems to have been very comfortable and secure within this non-patriarchal relationship. In the sources, we have no evidence to suggest that they had marital difficulties. On the contrary, long after Khadija's death in 619, Am Huzn, the year of sorrow, we have hadith reports in which the prophet praises her character and her unwavering support for the early Muslim community. And the financial element of that is actually a huge story and a subject for another related paper. The longevity of the marriage also says something about Muhammad and Khadija's compatibility. This is a monogamous union that lasted 25 years until Khadija's death. To quote Aisha, Allah's apostle did not marry any other women until her Khadija's death. Now given that polygamy was the norm at the time, some historians have suggested that Khadija and Muhammad had a marriage contract that explicitly stated that Muhammad would not marry any other woman unless Khadija died. In our reading, the historical descriptions of Muhammad and Khadija's marriage point to a man who was acutely non-hegemonic, especially by our own 21st century standards. This was a man who was comfortable marrying his very successful employer, a woman who was 15 years his senior, and who had been in two previous marriages with children. So there are a number of features that challenge hegemonic understandings of quote unquote, ideal Muslim marriages. Khadija's age, her status as a divorcee and widow, her initiation of the marriage, her economic independence and professional success, the marriage's matrilocal and monogamous character, and finally, the type of secure, non-hegemonic, and beautiful masculinity that not only emerged, but flourished within this prophetic partnership. We go back to Sarah. So let me conclude. And I want to conclude by looking at modern objections. So modern scholars and what they have to say. 
the first problem is with virginity. The fact that Khadija was not a virgin is a big problem for modern scholars. Razwi, who Shadab has talked about already, refutes the fact that she was married before. He does not mention it, he silences it with it. So for Razwi, Khadija needs to be a virgin. Now this is not a problem of Razwi as a person. He stands for an attitude that is the idea that our prophet married a non-virgin is so offensive to him that he cannot read it, he's not able to. Right? But it's not an individual failure, it's a failure, of, it's, it's indicative of our attitude towards this. The same goes for Khadija as initiating the marriage. For Razwi, it was her friend Nafisa who thought about it. She thought they were compatible. She went behind her back. She didn't tell her. And she went to approach the prophet. And the final one, which is probably, or it's actually not the final one, but the, one, the third one is the ability to provide and this financial vulnerability. Ling, who is another contemporary Muslim scholar, who's otherwise extremely comprehensive, fails to speak about the fact that the Prophet was not able to pay the mahr. The Prophet was an orphan. He didn't, um, like um, many uh, Muslim orphans in the, in the Arab world, actually did not, because his father died before him. If your parents die before you, you often don't, you don't inherit from your grandfather when they die. So he was very, very financially vulnerable. And Ling can, can, cannot deal with that. And of course, this is very, this is again indicative, this, this idea, and I'm gonna come back to this in a second, of not being able to be a provider, but also not just that, not being able to be economically superior or equal to the wife. And finally, this idea of a working wife. Let's go back to Razwi, and I want to read this in his words. Razwi writes, once Khadija was married, she appears to have lost interest in her mercantile ventures and in her commercial empire. Of course, she never lost her genius for organization. Now, instead of applying it to her business, she applied it to the service of her husband. On the very first day, she took charge of her new duty, which was to make the life of her husband happy and pleasant. I think this quote speaks for itself. And again, the invisible picture that this paints is this 1950s perfect housewife. Could be a businesswoman, but she is even more perfect in her real place, which is the home. So we did not say, we didn't give you a story that you don't know. All of us as Muslims and non-Muslims, and especially as Muslims, grow up knowing about Khadija, respecting her, loving her, learning about her. We know these stories. These are not stories that we are not familiar with. But despite us knowing these stories, we don't use them. We don't think about them when we think about an ideal marriage. Why? Why can't we say, well, this is a sunnah. Why can't we go to that? Why does nobody say, be a good, um, you can let, go into a good Muslim marriage, marry somebody who's 15 years younger than you. Why isn't that part the way we understand Muslim Sunnah? Let me give you an example. In Jordanian personal status law, there is a concept of kafa'a. And kafa'a has multiple elements, religious kafa'a, which means compatibility. Religious and financial, uh, and it was educational, it was taken out. Financial kafa'a is when the husband is equal or superior to the, to the uh, economic level of the father. And it's the only time that if a, ma a man and a woman get married without the guardian, which is very hard, so I don't know how exactly that would happen, but if without the guardian's approval, and they got married, the guardian can come back and annul the marriage. That is the only time, if there is no financial um, compatibility. So if the, if the Prophet and Khadija had lived in Jordan in 2021, Khadija's guardian could have annulled her marriage. We need to think about that. 
I mean, we need to think about these Muslim family laws that would not even let our own prophet marry. And we need to think about what taboos we are actually holding. What are we, what are we celebrating here? Is it something that comes from our heritage? Or is it actually modern, conservative, and yes, Western European values of a nuclear family? Very particular. But what we have is we do have in the Sira a lot that we can work with. And we can go back to and say, no, actually, no, we don't need those. These are not our gods. We have, we have a god and we have a prophet who has a story that we can use for a much better reality and much better marriages. Thank you. Thank you, Shadab and Sarah, for another uh, cracking one, cracking presentations. Um, something you were saying, Sarah, as in why don't we use this um, today? Why don't we use that as an example? I'm just wondering whether we kind of gap fill. I think I've done it because when we think of Khatija's marriage, and it was, yes, we know she was older. Yes, we know she did the proposal. We know that she was a businesswoman. Then I think my brain stops then I think I start filling in the gaps. I kind of really didn't think about who moved in with who. I didn't sort of think about, did she stop working? Did she carry on working? And maybe I started filling in the gaps in my mind because of our patriarchal upbringing that um, perhaps she moved in, uh, perhaps she moved in with the prophet, perhaps she gave up work, perhaps she went into the background and maybe these are my assumptions. So I kind of filled in the gaps and maybe that's what a lot of people do. So when I was reading the chapter, I thought, okay, I'm reading this chapter. I know what this book is about. It's going to tell me that um, it, it was an equal partnership, um, that you know I, sh I shouldn't be having these assumptions. But when I was reading the chapter, actually it wasn't an equal partnership. She was a more dominant partner. She was the one who was in charge and in control, really. And I feel that in modern day today's narrative, her power is diminished. We don't really hear her true power, really. So it's really good that you know we've got um, you know your chapters, your your writings to really sort of bring that out. That's the first thing that I would say. Um, before we take questions, I have a question, so I'll I'll ask my question for all of you. Um, it was actually in the opening chapter of your um, uh, opening paragraph, um, and I think you were quoting the typical thing that we all know that marriage is half of your deen, you're completing your deen if you get married. I sort of feel uncomfortable about that because I just think about uh, men and women who haven't got married because they've not met the right person. I think about uh, people who get divorced. I think about widows. I, pe I think about people with mental health. So does that mean that they're half a Muslim or less Muslim? So I feel kind of uncomfortable um, about that. So you can think about what we want to say about that, but that's a really popular uh, narrative that's used to try and coerce someone into getting married, or if somebody wants to get out of a marriage, particularly women, or you better not get out of that marriage because you know, you know you've been fulfilling half your deen and just stay in that marriage. So I kind of feel uncomfortable about that um, narrative. So let's take questions, and then you can answer that afterwards. Yes, a lady. Here. There's a there's a mic somewhere. Okay, hi. Hi, my name is Sofia Chuklaki. I'm a PhD researcher here at SUAS. And I want to uh, direct my question to the couple. Thank you for your presentation. And I'm sorry because I will destroy the good mood of the event because firstly, to answer your last, your conclusive question, why we don't use this as a sunnah, I don't know what is the experience of uh, Muslim women from Muslim majority countries, but as a Western born and raised convert, I have to say that there are thousands of cases of converts from the West, women, 
that we are being approached by younger men from the MENA region and they quote the exact this event as Sunnah and we ended up, and I was one of them, my, my second husband was Egyptian and 10 years younger, I ended up having the house, paying for all the expenses because of this Sunnah. So when men want, they do quote the Sunnah. Now this experience, <laughs> this experience has led me to be very hesitant to use and abuse Hadija's example as Islamic because all of that happened 15 years before the, even the first revelation, not the Quranic revelation itself, the rest of it, just the first contact. So to what extent is it suitable to use societal practices of specific individuals of specific circumstances as Islamic, something that happened a decade before the first revelation. Thank you. A really interesting question. Thank comment. you, thank you. <laughs> I did my best. Any more questions? And oh, over, th over there. The button yeah. on there. Yeah. I switched it on. And my question is, nowadays, uh, females regard it as a red flag if um, there's a male who's taking interest in them um, because they're earning more than a man. Um, or like men from abroad prefer women from the UK for visa or, you know, for financial um, material benefits. So to what extent would you say um, it's not acceptable or it is acceptable? Um, yeah. Because according to, I don't know, according to Sunnah as well, it's also the man who's meant to provide, so it seems a bit confusing. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. It's kind of a bit similar, so that's good that we can uh, link the questions. Um, Mira? Um, I think when I was also reading the book and just listening to the things that are being said today, I, I just wonder, are we actually idealizing marriage too much because... I wonder really, when I think of all the sort of marriages I know of, that hardly any of them are like this, right, as is being implied today. So maybe that's the norm. So maybe we might aspire to some of the things we've discussed, but actually maybe uh, the reality is that marriage is a mega struggle. You are two individual people who have to adjust to each other, you know, even with the best of intentions and everything, it's difficult. Marriage, by definition, is difficult. Uh, and I think that the question that I'm exploring a lot at the moment is that as women become more confident in, uh, uh, you know, uh, within their faith and everything, uh, maybe we take the lead in some things, but does that disempower men? Does women's confidence, self-confidence in our faith disempower men? And the question is, is it or isn't it? I mean, it's a question. Uh, and therefore... Uh, you know, what responsibility or role do we have in maybe sometimes being super diplomatic in order not to run the race too fast <laughs> and the men don't catch up with us? Because this is what everybody's saying now, that men are not catching up with us and they're, 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 they're way back, right? Tortoise and the hare kind of scenario. So how do we address some of these things? Let's, let's, let's actually start. Um, you've got a microphone there? Start to... Fantastic. So... I think the first one was my question. If you want to answer the, uh, then I'll go through the questions. I, I don't know enough about that particular deep report to answer. And I fall in the footsteps of Imam Ali, who's like, if you don't know something, be upfront about that. I also think that's a particular feminist practice. Um, so I think any type of script, any type of narrative can be manipulated. Um, and I don't think the fact that it can be manipulated means that it is bereft of critical ethical content in the present time. Um, What's interesting is that even though I'm a child of the West, I, live in, I lived in Jordan for 10 years, worked at a public Jordanian university, and the predominant paradigm is one of a more powerful established man and a younger woman who is dependent on the, the husband. And that was the dominant paradigm that we were trying to, uh, trying to challenge. Um, again, I think when it comes to, so one thing we get all the time sort of bringing some of the questions together is, well, Khadija isn't turned into a paradigm because she's pre-Islamic. 
And that's why Aisha is the paradigm, because she is quote unquote Islamic. And the whole point of coming together is really raising the who question, who gets to shape what is Islamic and by extension, un-Islamic, right? Because of the purposes of time, um, I gave like a 45 minute lecture on this at the University of Cape Town a month ago. Because of purposes of time, we only looked at the first snapshot. The second snapshot is about the presence of Khadija radiallahu anha during the first Quranic revelation. And I threw out to the audience, we could have had a whole narrative of Khadija given to us, but we were given two snapshots. A life is comprised of an infinite number of snapshots. We're given two. Why is one of the snapshots fundamentally connecting her to the Quranic revelation to the extent that if she did not convince the prophet that he was a prophet, we wouldn't even be Muslims today, right? What is the hikmah? What is the wisdom behind that? So I think we really need to sort of raise red flags. Well, when I think something is Islamic or un-Islamic, is that natural? Is that innocent? Or have I also been shaped by the patriarchal context in which I've been brought up? Um, thank you. So, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about when you asked your question um, is also, you know, you said, you know, it's off, it's, it, there is you know, a problem with getting married and finding the one. And of course, that idea of finding the one, this idea that there's one person out there and we have to find them, and it's also not a very modern idea. And one of the things that is, it's not just with Khadija that was okay that she was married before. When you look at the, at the, the, the early companions, they were all married, you know, divorcing, marrying each other. So there was, I, I think there's a, almost a Hollywood kind of emphasis on marriage as this ultimate goal that we have to have. And we have it too as Muslims. We have it as, it doesn't matter where we grow up. We grow up with that fantasy. So it's, so I think it's also part of that, uh, is, is that. But one of the things that we, in the, in the paper, I think uh, we've tried to think through is how, what type of, and you're absolutely right in terms of idealizing, but what type of marriage can bring up, can be one where you could really bring out the best potential? Like what, what, what does it need to look like? Because marriage can be hell on earth and it can be the greatest thing ever. But w what do we need to do? And how is that um, the most incredible potential? What, how, can we, how can we get to that? Whether we can get to that at all is of course questionable. But I think that's, that, that's the question. So let me just go back to your uh, question, Sophia. I think what you're talking about is indicative of wider global structures and capitalism, colonialism, where you have, this is one way of people, of young men in the global south to be able to, to get out. You know, in a world where we, we're told the world is a global village, well, for whom is the world a global village? For certain people, they don't even have to think about visas. Others have to go across the Mediterranean and die in order to get to Europe and get work. So this is part of that. And of course, we have very similar experiences of young Asian women who end up marrying very, very old men to get out as well, right? So yes, they're using an Islamic language, right? But this is more indicative, I would say, of, of current global inequality. And that's an outcome of that. I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. So Leila Ahmed has actually, has, 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 and Shadal has alluded to this, though Leila Ahmed actually speaks about this. And she basically says, which I assume you're also kind of insinuating, is that it's not. It's this Khadija is pre Islamic, whereas Aisha is post Islamic. Yeah. I didn't say Hadij altogether, and we shouldn't generalize. I'm very specific in what I'm asking. The specific decisions and actions of Hadija before the first revelation. After the first revelation, alhamdulillah, we, nobody has a problem. And it's not a competition between Aisha or Hadija or Maria de Qurbiya or all the wives. Not at all. The specific decisions and actions and social status of Hadija before the first revelation, to what extent is it normal to assume it or to label it Islamic. But the, the, so you actually answered a little bit what I was going to say. First of all, is of course, 
we don't have Khadija just before Revelation. We do have Khadija after Revelation too. And this is important. We don't have, there should not be one example where we just say, well, it, it cannot just be. So the, the th what continued after Revelation was that what was before Revelation continued after Revelation in terms of matrilocal, in terms of uh, Khadija supporting. And part of our paper is actually looking at not just Khadija, we know that Khadija is the first Muslimer, but this idea is had Khadija not been there, to, how, to what degree would the Prophet have even known that he's a Prophet? I mean, there, there, it was in that very supportive environment where the Prophet was actually contemplating that he was going crazy. And he said, there was nobody more hateful to me than a crazy person, a madman. And I, he was thinking of throwing himself off the cliff. And again, the traditional sources have no problem with that, that vulnerability. And it's actually Khadija who keeps him kind of sane and says, no, this is, you know, you, you're not, you're the Prophet. So it's within, it's within that context. And, and I think what we, what the problem is that we try and focus on what is most natural to us based on our, what, what is natural uh, for, uh, on our um, uh, problem. So this is, and this is connected, and again, it's in the chapter, the issue of masculinity, because that's at the core, I think, of the paper as well. We look at masculinity and what is kind of considered this idea of, you know, a sugar mama, you live with somebody who's like, you know, and that that is very, very, it's not masculine. Of course, we have, again, if you look at Hollywood, we look at these, you know, there's no problem with these beautiful models being married to these old men who are, you know, th these men are still men. Whereas these young men who are not, you know, are not providers, are not able, there's a, there's an attack on their masculinity. And what we're saying is that this story is one through which our our masculinity it's 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 very not masculine for us. But actually, if we're interested in in an Islamic model, we need to rethink our understanding of masculinity. Would you like to have a go now at answering this question? Yes. Or oh, many questions. I think I can have a go at all questions together. Because the definition of it being Islamic or not Islamic is actually excellent. Because you have 14 centuries in so many different geographical locations with so many different ideological backgrounds. So all of them are Islamic. Whether you are looking at the Mu'tazala or their enemies, whether you are looking at Sunnah or Shia, whether you are looking at uh, you know anything, per, uh, Persian people or Indians or Uyghur, Chinese, they are all Islamic. So you, you cannot exclude something as being not Islamic or Islamic based on a time frame or a geographical location or a certain ideology. And this is the beauty of this heritage that you will find anything you look at, you're looking for within this huge heritage. That is one thing. The second thing, nisfijinakum. This nisfijinakum is a construct, and you need to put it in conversation with the other hadith. You have another hadith, khudu nisfijinakum min tilka al-humayra'u is Aisha. So you take off your religion from what Aisha taught. So if you get divorced and you are only half a person, because you are no longer married, then you take Aisha's teachings and you're a full person again. So, no, see, no I'm, I'm serious. Uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, you need to put this in conversation and think of in a dina in the layl Islam. But they have been interpreting this that only Muslims are the real believers. But, uh, but can Ibrahim can a Muslim and Hanifan. So, Ibrahim was the father of all the prophets. So, all the prophets are Muslimun whether it is Jesus or, or uh, Moses or Muhammad, they are all Muslimun by the Quranic definition. So you, you just need to divorce yourself from the fiqhi, man-made stuff, and go back to the Quran where you will find your answers and in the Sunnah of the Prophet. And the same with the question of disempowering men by being uh, uh, more successful or uh, the breadwinner or so on. No, because the Quranic model is خَلَقْنَا لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَيْجَرْ So a couple is half of one. So the unit is the couple. 
So it's not a competition because everything boils down to the couple being one unit. Who, who I mean, yes, with what they spend, but if the man doesn't work and the woman spends like Khadija, that's fine too because you don't have a single model. Everything goes because everything is Islamic or not Islamic. I mean, it's, it's your definition and to be more inclusive, uh, you need to widen uh, the scope a bit. And the ideal marriage doesn't exist because even the prophet, and I, I go through this in my chapter, had a very a huge repertoire of things about conflict resolution because he knew that co marriage was in involving a lot of conflict. Uh, you, you're not supposed to uh, spill marital secrets. You're supposed to trust your wife. He even has advice that if the husband was traveling and he came home at night, he should send someone to warn his wife that he was coming. I mean, today you, you'd say this and people would say, oh, so she can tell her boyfriend to go home or whatever, right? But it's not like that. It was, it relates to the mutual care because he, it, he will give her time to beautify herself for him and not wake up in her pajamas and with the, you know, um, I don't know, no longer elastic band fitting and her hair disheveled because he was away and he's now coming home. So he will give her time to, you know, uh, look her best and, and he can also look his best when he, come in, when he comes in. So it's, uh, it's the, the conflict resolution part is, is quite big. Like uh, when he had his problems with his wives, he didn't hate them, he didn't divorce him, he up and left, separated from them for a whole month until everyone cooled off and then they had a talk about it. So it's, there is no foolproof um, manual on how to have the ideal marriage, but at the end of the day, the prophetic advice about marriage in general is quite useful, whether in the bedroom, outside of the bedroom, in conflicts, or even in the kitchen. And hopefully all of that will minimize the struggle in the marriage. Okay, let's take some more questions. Who's got some more? Right at the top. Not really a question, but just a reflection. Um, it's interesting that when you were talking about the economical situation of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Khadija at the time, and other, uh, and other examples you've given of the, you know, the difference in age and the economic prosperity of one spouse to the other, and talking about um, dominance and power, which is quite interesting because we're talking about equality anyway. Um, and just just a reflection that of course we know in the world in, in the capitalist construct that we live in that economic um, power you know leads or leads to that dominance and that comes into dynamic of relationships but also in the spirit of paradigm shift and feminism how about if we m put more of an emphasis on the role that a traditional woman plays in the home and, and what power that has. Because I think in a lot of what we hear that, um, and, and this is something that I'm grappling with, is that the role of the woman in the house as a nurturer, as a nourisher, as a supporter. I mean, Khadija had a huge part to play in supporting the Prophet in doing the biggest mission of, of you know, for all mankind. And that's a really powerful position, even if, she, you know, perhaps she, I don't know, we don't know whether she did give up her work or not, but if she did, and she p stepped into a role of supporting her husband with the message. She was driving that, which I mean, we're all benefiting from now. So it's it, it's it's just a reflection that um, it would be great to start talking about the power that women have as supporters and nurturers as well, not just linking power and dominance to economic, you know, uh, success. So that's what I wanted to say. Well, thank you, and we can turn that into a question because that's a really Excellent point, really. So we can turn that into a question. Um, who else would like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, 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 just just wait. Is there anybody else on that, that down here who wants to ask a question? No, should we answer that question? And you can think about another question. Okay, so do you want to... Um, and I think that point is an excellent one because when we think about power we think about economics and we think about age 
um, even now. But actually, what we do in the house is so important because now, if, if the woman isn't uh, bringing up the kids, doing all the household chores, that is what's allowing, say, for example, the husband, if he's the one who's working, to be able to do that. So why are we not associating power with what happens, um, you know, with the household chores? So would you like to, who would like to have a go at commenting? And Okay, do you want to go first? Um, there is something in, uh, in uh, Islam that is called al-kadda wa which is matrimonial wealth. So women should be paid for doing household chores. Uh, they don't do it just without anything. And uh, there is a case uh, during the Prophet's time where uh, a woman was married to uh, a guy and she was um, working with leather, sewing it. And he was a merchant taking it and selling it. And then he died on his last trip. And uh, his uh, relatives descended on her, uh, threw her out of the house because the house was his. And they gave her her share of the inheritance and asked her to leave. So she went to the prophet and she said, excuse me, you know, uh, he was trading with my share. And not only that, when he was away, I took care of the house. So the prophet said that before the inheritance at all, uh, she gets to get all the expenses of what she put in uh, that he traded with. That was number one. Number two, her job was paid. She, because he took this and traded and, gave, and came back, gave her the money. So she needs to be paid for the work she's done. She needs to, to be paid for taking care of the house when he was not there. And then she needs her share of the house because the house was bought with matrimonial wealth that they accumulated together. And then after that, she gets her share in the inheritance. So first she deducts all that, and then she gets her share, and then the relatives can claim theirs. So it's not uh, that the traditional woman stays at home and feeds the kids and does the laundry. In fact, the traditional woman from all the prophet's wives, Umm Salama was his political advisor, saw so in an orphanage and also traded with shoes and, and leather works and spent from that proceeds on that orphanage. So uh, it's not that the traditional woman at all uh, is just nurturing and keep minding the house and not getting paid for it or no, no. Islamically speaking, if we are doing it right, this wouldn't happen. Did you want to also comment on, on that? You've got your microphone there. Oh. Keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. No, exactly. I mean, this is, uh, so that when you say, it doesn't mean care work is extremely important, should be valued, absolutely. But that, that was not part of Islamic quote unquote duties of the wife. In Islam, it is not the duty of the wife to do any housework. That's not part of being a wife. That's part of being a wife now, but it's not part of being a wife then. That doesn't mean that that is not important, but that's a different story for a different, it's a different project, which is an important project. But I think the important thing is what, what we're trying to say is certain things have become a law and certain scenarios are being prevented by law to happen. And that's the problem that we're looking at, which doesn't take away from the importance of care work and how much we need it. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that, that you know, I think reclaiming housework, childcare, cooking, cleaning is absolutely critical, but it's absolutely critical that men reclaim these activities in the words of Amin Wadud as the work of Allah inside the home just as others are doing the work of Allah outside the home. Because if you don't do that, women are in double bind. I grew up seeing my mother work from dark to dark, before the sun rose, until the sun, until after the sunset, doing all that work. You're exploited in the workplace only to come home and do the housework all over again. That's why I'm a feminist, not because I read a book, because I was doing the dishes with my mother and I was learning from my mother, right? And this is the thing, men have to reclaim that. And if men don't reclaim that, we end up being in a very tricky situation then where actually a traditional setup is at least relatively less oppressive than that type of double bind. So I think men need to reclaim housework proudly with fakhr, with pride, as the work of Allah in the home, as the Prophet, as your presentation showed. We're gonna wrap up the que uh, session soon and we're on time, but I'm gonna ask really two quick questions and maybe it can be short answers. So we've talked about the 
the, the model marriage, but were the companions practicing the model marriage? And how quickly did people stop practicing, the early Muslims practicing? Did they even do that? We're assuming that they did. And is there, has any been surveys been done that which country, Muslim majority country, is more likely to be practicing it as close, not as close as possible, but even some of it? I don't know if any, any research has been done in terms of what's happening in Muslim majority countries, whether they are practicing some, some, some of that model. And that would be the last question. And the answer could be, you know, you don't know or it's not been done. So I haven't, I haven't researched that. I think that this is really an invitation to do more research, and this is the beginning of a conversation. I think there was a message about not enough quotes in the presentation. It was very limited time, but it's very extensive. I don't think there's any more research that could be done on Khadija in terms of the two snapshots that we unpack. So please buy the book. I just want to end on, on our note by saying it's not about like a competition between different types of prophetic marriages. It's about calibrating our turas, our tradition, with the realities of our lives today, all right? Uh, that model, the 1950s model, does not exist. That Victorian model does, does, does not exist. Hegemonic masculinity is a fiction. Most men cannot actually live up to hegemonic masculinity. In the context of the cost of living that we exist in, men cannot pull out a checkbook. It doesn't work that way. It's a fiction that we're all trying to live up to, but ultimately can't. So it's about saying, look, if we have an example, 25 years sunnah, that is more compatible with our realities today than other examples that cannot fit our realities today, why has that been erased? That's the larger question we're trying to raise. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, uh, but I think it's a very important question. And I think, I mean, Keisha Ali, who you've mentioned already, I mean, I think this, the ideal marriage was gone very quickly, again, through power relations, especially through the Futuhat and slavery. So, act, and, and Leila Ahmed talks about this. So. I don't know how, how, how uh, but again, it's important to, situ to, to distinguish between what political economic systems were there and how they were they oppressive and how did they then lead us to, to normalize and say, you know, normalize certain oppressive behaviors in the name of Islam when they weren't, when they were about slavery, when they were about other things. So, and to say no to that, I think, is quite important. Is there one last comment? No? Okay, fantastic. So we're on time. On time. So, what a fantastic panel, round of applause. Thank you so much, I've learned so much. Thank you to the speakers and moderators for that lively discussion. Thank you for making it so interactive so that this discussion keeps continuing outside of this hall.